You can, you can proceed, you can proceed. Okay, so you can hear me? Yes, okay, proceed. So I'm not getting anything. Okay, I'm not getting any response. Okay, fine. Um, good morning, I guess, distinguished guests. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. My name is Victor Lawila from the African Quarter of the Board of Pisa, but I'm also from the Center for Human Rights in Stanton, Maine, uh, where I did my master's, and it's very, very difficult. I have the unenviable task of following Professor Kidun. So thank you very much uh, for the support that for putting me inside. Touch on. So I thought you would touch on many of the things like our jurisdiction and the spirit and so on and so forth. I'm sorry, but it just, seems we just lost you for a couple of seconds. Please just, um, uh, if you can go back for about 10 seconds, that would be fine. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, so I was saying that I have the unenviable task of following Professor okay. Um, in this presentation, and I, I don't know if you heard also, I said I'm an alumni of the Center for Human Rights, that's where I did my master's as well, and I am a legal officer at the African Court. Um, so, in terms of engagement with civil society, I would like to speak about um, the advisory opinion procedure, the contentious proceedings before the court, legal aid, Accessing the court through the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, which is the Bank's Commission, um, Amicus Curie or Amici, uh, non judicial engagement, uh, opportunities for CSOs, and available resources. I hope you can hear me and uh, follow it. Yes. Okay, so Article 4 of the court's protocol, um, which Professor Miguel spoke about, the protocol creating the African Court on Human and People's Rights. And rules 29 1B and 82 to 87, the court, court's rules, um, basically uh, by the advisory procedure, advisory opinion procedure of the court. So, advisory, advisory opinions of the court are non binding interpretation of the law and usually on subject matter of human rights. And those entities that are eligible to request for such an opinion are member states of the African Union the African Union itself, African Union organs, and then there's something called African Organization Recognized by the AU. This has been interpreted by the court to mean um, organizations, uh, African organizations, basically NGOs and CSOs, which have observance with the African Union, not with the African Union Commission, but with the AU itself, or with the ECOSOC, which, uh, which is the body that deals with civil society, or having an MOU with the African Union. So this one uh, was decided in several requests, including one which was submitted by the Center for Human Rights and the Coalition of African Lesbians, um, which was, uh, I think, in 2015, uh, 00 to 2015. Okay, so the advisory opinion procedure is important because it gives the court a chance to interpret important issues of human rights. So, for example, uh, the Pan African Lawyers Union, PALU, which is the uh, CSO that we engage with. Hello? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, um, I'm wondering if you're switching your video and so that the participants can be able to see you. I could, but now I was worried of the network because now it's been a bit problematic. But I, I definitely can. Um, the challenge is yeah. whether the network will go down. Uh, is it okay? Okay, that's fine. Uh, is there a presentation that you would like to share? Uh, I would, but... Okay, 
Yes, you can now see the presentation. Thank you. Is that okay? Yes, that's perfect. Um, Victor. Um, I'm going to. Victor. 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 Now, Victor, I just gave us the minute. We just want to transfer it to the main screen. That's Victor, can you hear us? Victor, you are muted. Charter and other or other international human rights instruments, uh, in respect of which such advisory opinion is based on in what he is seeking for the court to interpret. Um, so, it, and also the advisory of the request should not relate to any communication pending before the Banjul Commission. So, if, if the subject matter of the request is something pending before the Banjul Commission, then the court cannot um, receive it. It will be inadmissible. So, in that regard, the court usually communicates to the Banjul Commission to amend uh, the request for advisory opinion. To ask whether this is a subject matter that they are also considering. Okay, so now for um, a practical situation, uh, the Pan African Lawyers Union actually filed a request in 2020 regarding the COVID situation and especially on holding an election in the context of public health emergency. And they, got, they had three questions, uh, but briefly, maybe just the the court responded saying that to give effect of the, to the democratic principles and rights in the charter, the court concluded that parties may decide for elections within the time frame provided by law, notwithstanding the situation of COVID 19 pandemic. So, if you look at the, the interpretation of uh, the charter and the other instruments in this particular opinion by the court, the focus was really on what Professor Benino was saying, subsidiarity. So we are saying that, okay, you know your situation better than the court, you as a country, and uh, the standards should be according to what your law provides. But the, the, the important thing that the court kept emphasizing that they sh they should be consultation with CSOs and they should consult also health authorities, obviously, when making this decision as to whether to hold an election or not. But also another emphasis of the court was that um, you cannot simply deny people elections. You cannot postpone elections and simply say that, oh, okay, there is a pandemic, regardless of the situation, because as we know, different countries were affected differently, and in certain countries, the, the rates were low, and so they could be able to conduct um, elections. So um, that is in brief about that. So we move now to the contentious um, jurisdiction of the court. So for the contentious jurisdiction of the court, um, we usually look at jurisdiction admissibility merits and then preparations. Um, so we have for jurisdiction, we have personal jurisdiction, we have material jurisdiction, we have temporal jurisdiction, and then territorial jurisdiction. So personal jurisdiction is especially the most important, I would say, uh, in terms of NGOs, because Article 5.3 of the first protocol says for an NGO or an individual to seize the court of a matter, the country that they are fighting the case against must have not only ratified the protocol, but deposited a declaration accepting the competence of the court uh, for individuals and NGOs to bring such cases. So in that regard, I, uh, as you can see in the list, um, we had actually about 12 countries up to date that have made that declaration. Unfortunately, we have four that have withdrawn, and it is what I've uh, indicated, Tanzania, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Benin, and Rwanda, they have withdrawn their declaration. So now NGOs and um, individuals can no longer file cases against those countries. But the court has also indicated in its judgment that the cases that were filed and that are pending before those countries um, uh, withdrawn of the declaration to effect, which is one year after filing of such declaration with the African Union Commission, uh, those pending cases, the court has still has personal jurisdiction, so it can continue looking at that. And as you can see, South Africa has never made the declaration, uh, I guess, because the feedback we get is that 
to have a very excellent uh, national um, jurisdiction, which is good national courts and uh, your good national processes. Uh, at the end of exhaustion of local remedies, because this is part of our disability, um, if South Africa is to deposit the declaration in the court, then um, NGOs and individuals can then seize the court in such a matter. Yeah, um, the court does not also emphasize on victimhood. I know that human rights, they, you have to be affected personally uh, in the late violation. And the court also can rule in abstract law, which are, what I mean is, for example, you can bring a case challenging a law. You can challenge a law, for example, that bars elections or such and such, even if it has not uh, affected you. So something um, on, on, on this, something that affects the public, public interest in basically. Yeah, the, the, the court can insist on such cases. Material jurisdiction, as Professor Biluna said, the court has a vast uh, jurisdiction in terms of what subject matter it can consider. So it interprets and applies the charter, the protocol, but also any other relevant human rights instrument ratified by the state of the This is the widest jurisdiction you can find for any international court in this world. So basically, the court has interpreted, as you can see in the cases, in the FEDF case versus Mali, it interpreted uh, the Makuto protocol. It, it has also interpreted uh, the democ ECOWAS democracy protocol in the case of uh, APDH versus Cote d'Ivoire. It has also interpreted um, the African Charter on Democracy and Good Governance. And so, um, instrument doesn't have to be, even of itself, a human rights instrument. The court has said, as long as it financiates certain rights, then it has the government <laughs> And of course, it has to have been ratified by the state. Uh, temporal jurisdiction. So, temporal jurisdiction is simply means that uh, you cannot seize the court with cases uh, if that, that happen or with alleged violations that happen prior to the state uh, ratifying the court's protocol. But this temporal jurisdiction, if you look at our jurisprudence, it's not really very clear as to which point the court considers. This type of jurisdiction. In some cases, it says it considers the ratification of the charter, and then if the uh, violations are ongoing, and then now the, the subsequently the respondent state ratifies the protocol and deposits the declaration, then we will insist on such a matter. In some cases, it talks about that the deposit of the declaration has to have happened before we insist. So there's a bit of inconsistency. But yeah, the, the general principle is. Uh, respondent states should not be held responsible for things that happened before they accepted the jurisdiction of the court. Territorial jurisdiction, basically, what the court has interpreted is where did the alleged violations occur? So, usually, the alleged violations occur in the territory of the respondent state, except in one case, which is very peculiar and which I'm going to discuss about it Bernard Mona versus Benin and uh, six others which was delivered in September this year. So that one was peculiar because the, the, uh, the court also uh, made a pronouncement on extraterritorial jurisdiction. So where uh, violations happen outside the territory of the respondent state. Sorry, I was given up to 11 o'clock, right? Yes. I think they may have been unfair with my time because I think I have more time to that. Anyway, <coughs> I might have to ask for a request for extension of time. Anyway, admissibility. Um, admissibility is actually the conditions uh, in the charter. Uh, uh, Victor, the charter. Sorry to interrupt. Just to say, yes, you do have um, five, ten minutes extra because of the technical issues. So please um, feel free to make good use of that time. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll try to just be very brief and quick. Um, it's, it's difficult to really make a presentation on all the aspects of the court. Uh, usually it takes us maybe two days because also then I need to leave some time for the participants. Okay, admissibility, let's go. So admissibility is under Article 56 of the Charter. Uh, I don't know if the participants have been provided with the Charter, they can look at it later. So 56.1 uh, talks about anonymity. You have to indicate your name. So the applicant has to indicate their name. But you can also request to be anonymous. In this regard, we have a case called XYZ versus Benin, where the person requested to be 
community gave the reasons and the court accepted. The only issue is, unlike the African committee on the rights and welfare of the Chagai, this is something I like to say as well, and I think uh, our colleague will confirm in the next presentation. For the African court, we have to transmit the identity of the applicant to the respondent state. This is an issue of equality of parties. If you, your, your accuser has to know who you are. So if you if, if you come and request for anonymity, it will be for the public. So as I said, the case on XYZ versus Benin, for the public it is XYZ versus Benin, but for the respondent state, the identity of the applicant has been disclosed already. So this is also a good step whereby if, for example, someone is um, for bringing a case against a respondent state, the NGOs can then uh, get in and can you know, want to find the case really on behalf of that person. As long as the NGO can show that they're acting on behalf of that person, then it, it comes into the NGO's name. Um, Article 56, two, the case must co comply with the Constitution Act uh, of the African Union and the Charter. Uh, basically, we usually refer to Article 3H of the Constitution Act, which is the protection and promotion of human rights. So as long as um, the case alleges violation of human rights, then it will be considered to comply with Article 56. Two. Article 56, three, um, the case should not use insulting or disparaging language. Here, the, the issue is that the intent should be to bring um, the respondent state's or its institution to disrepute. So, if the language used really is, is scathing and, and, and its intention is to bring um, the institutions of the respondent state or the respondent state to disrepute, then uh, the case will be found inadmissible. However, this 56 3 actually it has been expounded on more by the African Commission, of which actually the court has relied on its students also widely. Article 56 also should not rely on mass media only, it should also be based on other sources. 56 5 is on exhaustion of local remedies. Here, the remedies have been sent to the ordinary judicial remedies. Um, and in the case of Alex Thomas, the court actually said that the remedies of the petition to the High Court and the review of the Court of Appeal decisions in Tanzania, specifically for Tanzania, are extraordinary remedies because they require an extra step. So they are not of, as of right. You cannot just file a, uh, an application for review as of right. You need uh, leave from the court. Um, Article 56, six, um, reasonable time, the case should be filed within a reasonable time. Again, the court is probably the only institution in the whole world which is very liberal with the cases being filed in, in, in this institution. So we have cases which have been filed eight years after exhaustion of local remedy, seven years after exhaustion of local remedy, which have been accepted by the court. But if you see, like, for example, the European Court of Human Rights, they are very strict. It is four months. If you see the East African Court of Justice, it is two months. So you have to file the case two months after exhaustion of local remedies, four months after exhaustion of local remedies. The court is a bit open ended, it depends on circumstances. Um, similarity of, um, sorry, Article 56 7, the case might, should not have been decided on the merits in another international forum. So we are consistent on this, and the court does three things, because there are one, a decision of the merits. There are similarity of claims, and number three, are there similarity of claims. So when, in terms of applicants, the court has said, if it is a public interest issue, the applicants need not be the same. So for example, yeah, you cannot have several people. The court is trying to dissuade a situation where several people keep coming. It's a different applicant, but they are still bringing the same issue. For example, they are challenging a law. So for example, they are challenging a law in the penal court, such a thing. So in, in terms of uh, public interest issues, the, the applicants need not be Amici Curie. So the court also utilizes Amici Curie where it uses the expertise um, of uh, various personnel. So, for example, if you look at the cases of Put Aman Gehi versus Tanzania, there was uh, the court actually requested for several um, institutions, the Death Penalty Project, Legal and Human Rights Center, for them to provide uh, expertise on the issues of the death penalty. And I think only the Legal and Human Rights Center responded and so it was admitted and there are situations where also it is the NGOs which are seeking to be unmuted and we've had such a situation and the court has granted the request but it has to make sure that your application is very neutral because amicus are just neutral they cannot be siding with one party or the other yes and there was a very interesting case in uh, 
no wrong in Nigeria against Rwanda. In this case, actually, the applicant was part of an NGO and then he was ceremoniously kicked out. So he was complaining that the NGO misinterpreted their laws, their internal laws. So the NGO itself requested the court to intervene in the case because it says it had been mentioned, so it needed to be to, to give its own point of view, and the court allowed that. Okay, legal aid. So very quickly, the court has a legal aid policy and it has a roster of legal aid providers. So the roster list of legal aid providers, this is for applicants only, because they are also given some kind of fee, uh, $2,000 maximum for incidentals, although we also have a legal aid fund for the aid, which has not been commercialized yet, because they have not appointed the board of trustees. So if that is appointed, then there will be more money, obviously, for, for lawyers who are engaging uh, in legal aid. Uh, any African lawyer with a practicing license and five years experience can apply to be enlisted in the roster, and the application is on a rolling basis. The forms are on the website. Um, you can also approach the court. Uh, for example, the East African Law Society and Pan African Lawyers Union. Actually, the court usually approaches them in certain cases for them to offer legal aid because we have a good relationship with this civil society organization. And then Professor Sandra Wapko and uh, the Cornell University also approached the court regarding some death penalty cases that they wanted to um, act as counsel. And in that regard, for example, in Ali Rajabu and Amini Juma and Robert Enrico, they brought about uh, challenging the mandatory nature of the death penalty in Tanzania. Not the death penalty itself, but the mandatory nature which denies the judicial officer um, the discretion to decide whether to give the death penalty or not. And in that case, uh, the court agreed with them. They said that's a violation of human rights. Uh, death penalty need not be mandatory. It is it violates the right of fair trial because the judicial officers should be given the discretion to make their own decision after listening to the circumstances of the case. Um, so the merits of the case, the merits is on alleged violations, obviously, uh, containing the charter or other human rights instrument, as I say. So the court has found, for example, that uh, a family court in uh, Mali uh, that was discriminatory in terms of the ages of marriage of girls and boys that it was found to be discriminatory, and um, the court ordered in that case that that family court had to be revised to, come, uh, to be consistent with the human rights obligations in mind. So, um, but when it comes to merits, also the applicants and NGOs in this situation are encouraged to elaborate and provide supporting evidence because this is a big issue. There are many cases where we, we receive and uh, the submissions are not detailed and they are not supported by evidence. And the court has said that mere allegations cannot be taken into consideration and we have to provide evidence. So, for reparations, the court, unlike other courts as well, uh, is very elaborated, maybe like the Internet and Court of Human Rights. It, it issues reparations on restitution, that is like restoration of liberty, reversal of criminal conviction, compensation, which is monetary awards. Uh, satisfaction, which is symbolic measures to restore the dignity of the victim, such as, such as an apology uh, or such, uh, guarantees of non reputation. This is whereby um, there is an order that they, they should do something so that they should reform the institution so that there is a guarantee that whatever violation has occurred will not occur again. And then we have invitation, which is restoration of the victim's well being. I'm really sorry that I'm going very fast. Because there are a lot of things, and I was given a very short uh, time, so you can uh, blame Poluso and Galvian. Anyway, monitoring of implementation of judgments in practice. So, uh, the court, as a matter of principle, does not have any right, uh, so to speak, to monitor its own judgments. So, the judgments, if you look at our protocol, Article 29, 30, and 31, um, states actually they commit to abide by the judgments of the court. And number two, it is the Executive Council, uh, Professor Bilyeu had mentioned earlier, the Executive Council is made up of um, 55 ministers of foreign affairs. And they are the ones who are supposed to monitor this implementation of the court's judgment. So what the court does is really, it transmits the, the judgment, once it delivers a judgment, for example, against Tanzania, and let's say it is in, uh, they are supposed to, like in Tequila, they are supposed to uh, amend the constitution so that to allow in independent candidature. So that judgment is then transmitted to the respondent state. The respondent state then is given uh, usually six months to indicate what they have.
terms of executing the judgment. So the, after the report, the court uh, uh, um, assesses the report and then informs the respondent state whether it is satisfied or not. If it is not satisfied, the respondent state has to keep filing reports. And at the end of the year, the court actually in its annual report indicates whether uh, the states have complied with this judgment or not. So far, Burkina Faso is the only country that has fully complied with the judgments of the court. Um, there are other countries have complied partially, and the biggest challenge of the court, really, the biggest challenge is the economy of So we rely on reports on member states, but thankfully, under our new rules now, we can rely on civil society as well to give us information. We can rely on the applicant to give us feedback. Because there are many cases where there is implementation of judgments, but unfortunately, the court, I mean, the court has not received such information officially. So we find out uh, maybe from the media, for example, that um, Gaddafi, Gaddafi versus Libya, Gaddafi was released. We find out uh, about the Kenyan case that uh, African Commission versus Kenya, that there are some steps taken by the Kenyan government to make sure that uh, these people can uh, be recognized as indigenous people. So we find out from media, and that is not the correct, of course, uh, procedure. Um, provisional measures, the court also may, may issue provisional measures when, 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 whereby in cases of gravity uh, and where they in, where they try to avoid irreparable harms to the persons. So to date, the court has issued provisional measures on execution of the death penalty, to stop the execution of the death penalty, on evictions, allegations of torture, excessive force on civilian populations, access to medical services, and also you find that the court, which has been criticized so much for being very liberal with the provisional measures regime, um, has issued more provisional measures than your usual average international court. But provisional measures are just that they are provisional. They are not supposed to prejudge the merits of the case. They are simply to make sure that the subject matter of the case is in intact. So if it is a person who is on death row, we make sure that that person has waited for the decision of the court um, before he has So accessing the court through the commission. So Article 51A uh, of the court's protocol also indicates that the Bandit Commission can also seize the court directly. So we can file cases against the, the, <coughs> the countries that have ratified the protocol. To date, there are 33 uh, countries. So South Africa is one of them that has ratified the protocol but has not deposited the declaration. So the African Commission, for example, can bring a case against South Africa to the African court. So um, the African Commission has brought uh, cases against Libya and Kenya to date. And in the case against Kenya, actually two representatives of the Commission who are from civil society, that is Mr. Donald Bear and Selemani Kinyamu, who are actually from the Pan African Lawyers Union. Uh, the case was about indigenous people's rights. There was a, there was a colleague who was asking about indigenous people's rights. So, the African Commission against Kenya case is a very good case to read. Uh, I agree with Professor Sibinu that uh, the working group on indigenous people in the Commission are better placed, but you, you can also read the African Commission versus Kenya. We recently delivered also our uh, reparations judgment. Okay, so quickly, I know you have a session, uh, for Luso, I hope I'm not stepping on your toes. You have a session on, uh, on how the CSOs can engage with the, with the court, I mean, with the African human rights bodies. So quickly, in a judicial engagement, I've already spoken about judicial engagement. The court has sensitization missions, whether it is supported by a protocol or not, that's a different issue. And it has undertaken uh, so far about 34 of these uh, to 55 countries, basically giving visibility to the court what we do, as Professor Vinyuna said, many people will find very interesting that even in the host country, and even as we've been here for 16 years, there are still authorities who do not know what the African court do, actually. Uh, we engage state authorities, we engage uh, human rights institutions, we engage by associations and human citizens. So we can say that sensitization visit to Tunisia and Niger, which was done last year, they went to Niger, resulted in the deposit of the Article 36 declaration. The Niger president, especially, has a civil society background, and so we leveraged that opportunity to convince him to deposit the declaration. We also have conferences, the court calls conferences from time to time on thematic areas. Last year, we had one on the implementation and the impact of this judgment. And of course, Professor Vigun is a friend of the court, literally, and not just uh, as an amicus. And so we invite him and other, of course, members of civil society from time to time to take part in this. Consultancies and partnerships as well. And we also have the African Human Rights Yearbook, where they support for people to publish on human rights issues. And this is done every year. I think we've done six um, editions.
So um, just yeah. about to close. Just I'm just yeah. about to close. Okay. Sorry? You have five minutes left. Ah, yeah, sure. It's five minutes yeah. is more than enough. Thank you. So opportunities for CSOs, this is what I was saying. So CSOs have opportunities to raise novel issues in the court, such as climate change, terrorism, minority rights. Um, the CSO called SELA, uh, Social Economic Rights Project in Nigeria, had actually raised a uh, request for advisory opinion on whether poverty is a violation of the African Charter. Unfortunately, they are not an organization with observer status at the AU, so we rejected that uh, request, unfortunately not. Now, we have a case called Bernard Warner versus Benin and others. This is a case which I wanted to talk about, where the applicant actually, who, was, who is a Ghanaian, alleged violations of human rights of the Sahrawi people as a result of the failure of the respondent states to, to safeguard their territorial integrity and independence. So this was actually about um, the right to self-determination being something called erga omnes, which means that the right to self-determination should be the and be protected by every country, regardless. It is something that is accepted in international law. You don't have to ratify any protocol. So the court said that um, the countries that, uh, that were sued here, which were Ghana, Benin, Burkina Faso, basically the countries that had uh, deposited the declaration. So you can see this was a very innovative way of getting around the Article 34 6 declaration, whereby um, they, basically this question is of the rights of Sahara people, but then they are suing. Tanzania, they are suing Benin, and they are suing such countries. Okay, so uh, civil society can enhance the visibility of the court as well, of course, by writing about the court and engaging with the court, participate in judicial processes, join the court's roster to open the participate in outreach activities, and also, importantly, relying on the jurisprudence of the court in national courts. Okay, available resources finally, we have a search on the website, we have law reports, and we have a manual on the procedures of the court, which is in the kitchen, we are cooking it. Hi, Victor. Okay, yeah, I'm um, Sabelos Banda from Action for Freedom in um, Cape Town. I'm interested to know on the aspect related to Amiki Kirai, is it um, possible to come in as an Amiki on a case which involves a country other than the country that you belong to? And then um, as well, I would like you to maybe talk to the issue of um, addressing AU bodies and the AU itself as litigants at the African court, how that can play itself out and how that can be basically facilitated. And further, on the opinion of the court, if one applies um, or rather approaches the court for an opinion on a particular issue, what is the status of that particular issue pending the outcome of the court. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? So thank you, that's the end. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, very quickly, Banda, thank you for your questions. They are, they are very good questions. Well, the first one, the Amiki Kiri thing is very open because you don't have to be attached to that particular country. It is a, it's very open. So what happens basically is the court may request or an applicant may request because um, what, what happens is when you get a case, uh, that application, there is a case summary that we do and then we put it in the website of the court. So if, if there's something of an interest or if there's something whereby um, an individual or an institution has expertise on and they think that the court will benefit from that, expertise, they can apply to the amici. The same thing as also in terms of intervention. Um, if you look at the protocol, the intervention 
looks like it is preserved in national <coughs> states. But now, according to our rules, if you have an interest in a particular case, you can apply to, to the court to intervene for that particular case. And you don't have to belong to that particular respondent state or have any connection with that. As I said, in the, in, you can see as in the one Bernard Mona, Mona case, it is a Ghanaian actually who is filing a case on behalf of the people of Saharawi against countries like um, Tunisia, Tanzania, Burkina Faso. Yeah, so thank you about <laughs> about the question of what is and the AU itself. So the court does not have jurisdiction um, to hear personal jurisdiction to hear cases against the AU itself and the AU board. The court as it is currently constituted. And this was also confirmed in the case of Femi Falana versus the AU. But then in the, the, the which is a, a protocol to the the charter, it is a protocol which expands the jurisdiction of the court. Uh, it's, it's a protocol which establishes the African Court of Justice and Human Rights. So in that end of, in that court, because no one so far has reached the 15 ratification threshold, yeah, so if that court sees the light of day one day, yes, in that court, AU can be sued, AU bodies can be sued, and that court will definitely have jurisdiction. In terms of um, the status of opinion, I maybe do not understand you very well in that regard, but usually when there is a request for uh, an advisory opinion, the court will then look at it in, in uh, what, what happens in the process is the advisory opinion comes, the court will then write to the African Commission and ask if the subject matter is pending before them, when it receives the opinion, and then now look at the subject matter, if you have to determine whether it has jurisdiction and uh, being the subject matter, uh, for example, we have ever had a request where by someone is asking about the Palestinian conflict. So obviously that, that is something that is not within the charter, uh, that is something that uh, then also the court will look at them, uh, how has it been framed the issues, have they been framed um, very clear, but the court can always get back to the parties if it needs more information. And also, more importantly, the court usually shares uh, every request with the member states of the African Union, and then they are also allowed to intervene with it, whatever information um, they have. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Victor. What I meant was, um, say, for example, if there is an appeal, the um, judgment appeals against is deemed suspended pending the finalization of the appeal. So I'm asking a question as regards where an opinion is sought on a particular issue, does that suspend the applicability of whatever it is that is um, being sought an opinion on? For example, we've got a scenario right now where the African Medicines Agency is looking at um, issues pertaining to the control of medicines and um, prioritizing pharmaceuticals over natural medicines and supplements. If that were to be presented to the court, but as against the different individual states for an opinion, as to whether the CTC can um, apply that as a result of the African Medicine Agency. Would the court be in a position to entertain that and therefore suspend the intended penalization of natural medicines and also supplements? Thank you, Peter. And also, could you please share um, your presentation if that is possible? Thanks. Yeah, thank you very briefly. Thank you, Rwanda. I will share my presentation. And regarding your question, no, actually, the court cannot, it will not have that suspensive effect. The only suspensive effect is when there's an order for provisional measures. So, if there's an order for provisional measures, and that is in the contentious jurisdiction of the court, if there's an order for provisional measures, then it usually suspends. Um, whatever the subject matter is, is going on uh, in the national setup. But then for, for the opinion, it's a totally different issue, and the opinions of the court are actually recommendations. They are only persuasive, they are also not binding.
the decisions of the court, for example, are binding. So this is what I will answer to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Um, just to say again, that um, for all of our presenters that do have uh, the slides, we will still share with everyone after Thank you. So our next speaker is Upal, who is with us here.